Well, here we are. It is unit B. We are uh, going to start a brand new unit in our geometry class here today. Uh, we're going to look at conjectures and we're going to look at inductive reasoning. This actually, this, this particular module is actually going to look a little bit more like an English class versus a math class. Not going to be doing a lot of mathematical things, but a lot more things with sentences and uh, how we can start reasoning our way through some proof writing down the line. So we're going to start off by looking at inductive reasoning. There are two types. There's inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is reasoning based on patterns. You look for a pattern and then you continue that pattern. Probably one of the uh, easiest ways to do this is to look at what they call a sequence in, in a math class. So we're going to use inductive reasoning to find the next number in this list. So we look at this list and we see, well, how, what's the pattern here and how do I get the next number? Well, it looks to me, and I'm sure it looks to you, like if you multiply 3 times 3, you get 9. 9 times 3 is 27. 27 times 3 is 81. And if I get my calculator out, I can certainly calculate 81 times 3. 81 times 3 is 243, and so that's where I get 243 would be the fifth term in the sequence, just using the idea of what's the pattern and continuing that pattern. That's what inductive reasoning is. So if we look at this next question, uh, uh, well, it's a conjecture, first of all, what a conjecture is. A conjecture is simply the conclusion you make when you reach uh, the conclusion you make when you are using inductive reasoning. Up here, our conjecture was that the next term was 243. Here, make a conjecture about how many regions are formed by 20 diameters. So we we're looking at a circle, and we're looking at a diameter. In this case, we have a circle with one diameter, and it creates two regions, a left half and a right half. Okay, let's do two diameters. So there's two diameters, splits the circle into four regions. If we think about what's going to happen next, it's going to basically, you'll notice that it's doubling in size. So that makes sense to say that if you have 20 diameters, you are going to have how many regions? Let's take a look at this one. This one's got three diameters. This one's got six regions. So we're going to have 40 regions when we have 20 diameters. And that makes a lot of sense. And we're looking at patterns built. If I do this, I get this. If I do this, I get this. If I do this, I get this. What happens when I put 20 in? I get 40 regions. And that's called deductive reasoning. As we move up, um, let's talk more about a conjecture. A conjecture can be a true statement, but it could also be a false statement, uh, a false conclusion. So we're going to be looking at things called theorems, and we're going to say, is it a true theorem? Is it a false theorem or a statement? Is it true or false? If it's false, if you look at it and determine, okay, this is a false statement, you might have to find what's called a counterexample. A counterexample is a specific example, a particular number or a particular image that shows that the conjecture is false. In other words, the first part of the sentence, the first part of the conjecture has to be true, the second part is false. So uh, let's take a let's look for a counterexample in each of these statements. Um, okay, if the name of a month starts with a J, then it's a summer month. Uh, okay, well January is not a summer month, but it does start with a J. So there's two things that have to happen. The first is this part has to always be true. So I need to have a name of a month that starts with a J to find a counterexample. But this part has to be false. So I need a J month that is not in the summer. January fits perfectly. June would not, July would not, but January would. So, sorry about that. January is in the winter, so January is a counterexample. Okay, when you multiply by two, the product is larger than the original number. Makes perfect sense. Seems like a true statement. You know, multiply one times two, you get a larger number two. Multiply two times two, you get a larger number four. Ten times two is twenty. It's a lot larger. But there is a counterexample. There's many counterexamples, and you just need to find one. What about negative numbers? Negative four times two is negative eight. And negative eight is not larger than negative four. So therefore, negative four, this number here, is a counterexample. So sometimes you've got to dig a little bit deeper into your brain and say, okay, there's got to be a twist here somewhere. So the negative number would be that twist. And those are our notes for our section 
B-1.